Okay, welcome to Patriot to the Core podcast. Uh, this is Lauren Sisler. We are at Sheepdog Firearms in Trustville, Alabama. So great to have you in Yes, person. so excited to be here. Of course, I know I messaged you right before this. I was like, so am I supposed to be like casual when I walk up in here? Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to get dressed up. And of course, you said casual. So I'm feeling good about this conversation and, uh, you know, just having a, a good conversation about life and things that come our way. Yep, yep. So I realized a few weeks ago, I was like, you know, this is going to be fun. As, as I researched you more and then I met you in person. So what gave that away? Was it my social media and all the crazy stuff that I do for a living? No, you looked pretty boring. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, you have a lot of fun. So uh, I, what I want to ask you first, though, is because there's plenty of stuff about you online, but really how do you introduce yourself or describe yourself when someone asks you to, to introduce yourself to them? So my byline, I guess in essence, my byline, there's a lot to it, but I usually just say Lauren Sisler, and I'm a sports reporter for ESPN, um, SEC Network, and AL.com here in Birmingham. So Birmingham is home base for me because I do work at AL.com and cover Alabama and Auburn uh, 365 days a year, right? And, um, you know, have the opportunity and the privilege to travel around with ESPN and cover games for them for sideline. The last two years I did uh, SEC Nation, and this year I'm taking on a new role, so I'm excited about Can it. Can you say it yet? Yeah, so I will be covering football. Yes, the press release officially came out, but I will be sideline reporting um, on ESPN and ESPN2 on Saturdays, uh, any given time slot, and essentially any conference. So I will be all over the country, and I'm really excited about the opportunity. So are you the new Aaron Andrews? Uh, the new Aaron Andrews. You know, that's one thing I, I, I tell people. I always say, um, you know, there's people that you look up to in this business as a sports reporter, people that you idolize and hope that you could be like one day. And I definitely, she was one of them. Uh, Leslie Visser, Tracy Wolfson, Laura Rutledge, Maria Taylor, they're all in the mix there. But I have to tell you, as I've tried to take away that comparison, I don't I'm going to be the next Lauren Sisler. <laughs> so here you are. Good. Awesome. Yes. I'm yes. right here on Patriot of the Court. Hello. Yes. yes. Okay. So you did a story, I don't know, a few years ago now about DNA testing in athletes. Yes. And it was like all this soft, soft twitch or a fast twitch and slow twitch for uh -huh. muscle fibers. Yeah. And you got tested too. Yeah. So what came of that? Is there a new like new studies that's come since Yeah, then. first of all, way to dig into the archives there. So that was a few years back when I worked at CBS 42. We traveled out to California, and basically all it is is a swab test. And you're able to determine based on that swab test if you have the fast twitch or the slow twitch. And then that can kind of put you in sort of a category to say, okay, you would be good at this sport versus this sport because of the fast twitch. Now, as a gymnast, yes, I am five foot nine. I'm going to stand up. Hello. Um, <laughs> As a, a five, tall very tall gymnast. Uh, so at, at five foot nine, I guess the DNA test doesn't tell you how tall you're going to be, but I do have fast twitch uh, muscles and fibers. And so it, as a gymnast, it is very fast twitch. You know, it's a lot of sprinting. It's a lot of quick burst versus the long distance. I mean, when you put me out there long distance, I can probably run about, I think my best mile in high school might have been a 645, which is fast, but, you know, age happens and, you know, that's how it goes. But that was something that was very unique in learning that you can actually kind of figure out based on those those fibers what kind of athlete you are prior to getting there and then really the goal of the study is not necessarily to say okay your child should be doing this sport but it's more or less honing in on those skills and saying okay well if your child's going to play this sport maybe this position is better than this position mm -hmm. whether it's football basketball baseball um, you name it but what about the training does it also help with how to train for some specific skills. Yeah, so basically it kind of helps you to hone in those skills and then the areas that you may be weaker in, then you know you've got to have added training. So obviously, you know, when you go out into these camps and these seminars, um, you know, they're putting you through all these different drills. And obviously every day when you're going out to practice and you're just putting, putting reps in, putting work in, those are the areas you can focus on. And so you can kind of throw out some of the other stuff and really focus your time on that. You know, as, as, a, as a basketball player, you're going to go out and, you know, shoot your threes and shoot your free throws and focus in on certain things. It's kind of the same thing. And it would be the same thing with track and field. Um, you know, what event or events might, might you be more suited for? Uh -huh. Um, because I think there is a level of talent and God-given talent that we know we're going to be better at. In gymnastics, four events for women, vault bars, beam floor. I was awful at vault. For some reason, I just could not get the vault down. Adrenaline was the only thing that allowed me to perform vault so in wait, a is competition. So wait, you jump? Is that the vault? Yeah, you run down the runway. Um, of course, the apparatus has since changed, but yes, you flip over the horse. It's now a table. 
and then you flip off of it and land. Okay, yeah. And so for some reason, I just could not get the hang of it. It was something that I was really, it was, it was really a struggle for me. I was, I was good at bars, I was good at floor, and balance beam, you know, is the, the, the long three inch, four, four feet off the ground kind of thing, um, where it can make or break you. And that's one of those things you can train all day long and still get up there and wipe out. So, you know, it's just interesting to kind of understand from that dynamic, um, you know, how athletes might be, their DNA might have a big part as to why they excel at certain positions or certain sports versus others. Mm -hmm. So let's get this out of the way first of all. Shout out to your alma mater. Where, where were you a gymnast at? Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. Um, I take great pride in my Scarlet Knights, very much so. Okay. I wear Scarlet on my sleeve. I have to remind people here in the state of Alabama, if you're an Alabama fan, when I wear red, it is not crimson, it is scarlet. So I make sure I let people know that. And also, let me remind you guys, you know, you might have a few national championships in that pocket, but guess what? We invented college football. Rutgers, the birthplace of college football, celebrating year 150 I'm this look year. That up. Is that true? Very true. Yep. <laughs> Rutgers played Princeton and we won. Oh, yeah, okay. We got okay. the dub. So, you know, that's always my claim to fame. I always say, you know what? We invented college football. So I don't care what our record says. We invented the sport. Okay. It's us. All right, good. So Thank what you. about how you train? Because I'm thinking, do, do I see you doing some CrossFit or something like CrossFit? Um, yes. It's called high-intensity interval training. It's called Torque is the class that I go to. And so I have to give a shout-out to my man, Lewis Sanders. He is a former NFL player. And he basically, um, his family's from here. And so he played for different teams. I know he played for the Patriots. He played for um, the Browns at one point. He played for the Texans at one point. And I think he spent nine years in the league. And so he is just straight beast mode. And uh, I love the accountability and the high intensity part of it. It's great because it's, a li it's, it's, a, it's lifting and cardio, but it's not so much the Olympic style lifting. So the good news about that is sort of the long-term effects and the, the joints and things like yep. that. So um, I love it because honestly, at, at my age now, not being able to, I tell this to people, there's no such thing as going out in the backyard and paying a pick, playing a pickup game of gymnastics, right? So like those days are gone. Um, but to be able to still kind of maintain. Can do a back handspring in the back I can still do a little bit, yeah. And if I put the grips on, I can still swing bars, but you better put me over a foam pit because there's no telling what's gonna happen. Um, but yeah, with that being said, I just like to be able to stay in shape and feel like I'm still accomplishing something every single day. And so I really enjoy going there and just the camaraderie that we have, and it's competitive, and it's fun, and I just think it's a good way to stay in shape. And I mean, it's for all ages. I mean, we've got people that come in there that are still in high school, and then we've got people that are, you know, nearing their 70s. Yeah, and well, I'm interested in this. So how does it compare to CrossFit? Is it still, you know, short workouts, 30 minutes, something like that? Um, it, it depends. There are days where we have those wads or those, you know, for time type things, or the EMOMs where you're trying to get so many reps in in a certain amount of time. But I think our workouts are a little bit longer, usually about an hour long, and it's a mixture of sets. So you're doing a set of, you know, you might be doing bar curls, and you might be doing dumbbell press, and then you might go run a hill. So you're kind of doing sets of things and then doing a cardio exercise in between. And so the accountability comes in where, you know, it's like zip your lips, let's go to work. Yep. That's so the hardest part. Are you have really? Yes. <laughs> so Imagine are you that. having to, on your, when you're doing sideline reporting, are you literally running from sideline and back through the back of the end zone to the other side. Um, yeah, it's it. That is a tough deal, and that's one thing I'm still trying to learn and to master, and really kind of learn from various sideline reporters in the business. Is that you have to be at the right place at the right time, and how do you know what the right place is? Because a quarterback might come off the field and he might throw his helmet off and start ripping and roaring and saying something that could be critical to your broadcast. But if you're not on that sideline in that given moment, or when coach chews out one of the players or something is said, then you might miss that moment. And so really it's just kind of a, it's somewhat of a gamble, but you kind of watch the game unfold and you watch the tendencies for each team um, offensively and defensively and you say, okay, you know what, I think I can get a good storyline for this. Let me go hang out behind this bench. I wanna go hang out behind the defensive lineman on this bench and see if I can get a read on what they're talking about and the coaches are talking about. So there's some strategy, it's tough. Um, and you, you can't win them all, you know, you, you just gotta hope to be there at the right time, at the right time. But um, you know, at the end of the day, you're you're getting information down there. I'm the eyes and ears for the people up in the booth and for the guys in the truck. And so that's sort of my job is to well, be yeah. the eyes and ears. I mean, I, I, when I'm watching on TV, lots of times they'll shoot to someone like you and they'll mm -hmm. say, "Well, this is what just happened." It's not maybe it's not even captured on camera, but 
or maybe they don't want the team may not want it on camera, but you can describe some situations that I want to know. Yep. So you got a cameraman or a camera woman mm -hmm. that has to keep up with you. Is that right? Well, I mean, what they'll do is they'll kind of split reps. So they'll be out covering the game and they'll be at certain points in the field. And so we have a way of, I, I guess, the producer will get in your ear and say, OK, I need you on the, the near 40 right side. So that basically means my cameraman, if I need to be on camera for something, or let's say we're about to do a halftime interview, We've already had that conversation with the um, SIDs, the sports information directors, prior to and say, hey, we're going to meet um, at the 30-yard line going into the end zone at, at halftime on the sideline. So that's kind of where I know about two minutes before halftime, i got to go stand there. My camera person will meet me there. We'll knock out the interview, and then they go on their way. And so there are, there's kind of, you know, some, some coding, if you will, to figuring out where I'm supposed to be at given times. Like, hey, you need to find your camera guy. Or let's just say I have something I want to show an example of. Like, there's a prop on the sideline. You know, they've got all this yeah. sideline swag these days. So maybe I want to, you know, show the money chain or the, the uh, you know, um, the, the belt, the belt right. or whatever it may be, the ball out belt. And so if, if I need to have that visual aspect, then I communicate to my uh, producer in the truck and then they get me lined up and say all right you're up yeah see I could talk sports for a while but I think this is very interesting though yes. because I've I've been to plenty of games mm -hmm. in person I've been close to the field mm -hmm. and plus I've of course watched many on TV mm -hmm. so what about um, you know, I think as I researched on you there's a lot of people that say yeah you hey Charles Barkley was a was an interesting interview Nick Saban um, but really what's been what interview has surprised you the most? Uh, maybe the person was not like you thought. Maybe that you thought they were going to be a, they were a jerk, but they really weren't, or they were very charismatic. What's one or two that stand out to you? Yeah, that's a really good question because I do think in this business you kind of go into it having sort of your perception of who's going to be what and how they're going to respond mm -hmm. to things and if they're going to be easy to talk to. And for the most part, I haven't run into anybody that I feel super intimidated by. I will say, though, when talking about Nick Saban, Early on in my career at CBS 42, um, I kind of had to earn that right to be able to interview him one-on-one. -on -one. And so you're used to being in a big room, and it's a press conference setting, and so you go around the room, and you hand the mic, and then you ask a question. So it's not so personal and one-on-one. -on -one. But then when you get to sit down with that person and have that one-on-one -on -one conversation, it's quite a bit different because suddenly now you are, um, you know, you are one-on-one -on -one and what you say, like they're taking in everything you're saying and you kind of can throw out some of the coach speak a little bit. You know, the coaches uh, might relate to you a little bit more or having more of a mm -hmm. conversation like we're doing versus sort of the scripted like, yeah, well, the boys just got to get out there and give 100% kind of talk, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, he, he was one of them, of course. Um, but in terms of surprises, like that's a really good question. Uh, that's probably one I have to think on, like who I would say really surprised me. Somebody that I actually uh, interviewed back at the national championship two years ago when it was in Atlanta, Herschel Walker, who played for Georgia, the running back stud. You know, yes. he comes off like in interviews kind of just, you know, I mean, he's a big dude and he's still, I mean, he's such an, in such push -ups. great you shape. Just take on his workout. I mean, unbelievable, right? I mean, it's crazy. And so we, uh, they're, they're previewing this thing for SEC Network called Saturdays in the South. And he was part of the round table. Um, he's one of the guys that's highlighted in this video and uh, just uh, got to watch him in a round table discussion just last week with Steve Spurrier and Archie Manning. So it was a very interactive group. But Herschel is funny, and I was very surprised because I always kind of got this feeling that he's just all work, all work, all work, and he is, but I mean, he's got jokes. He was telling the SEC, he was like, I want a job, give me a job. So he was telling the commissioner of the SEC he want, wants a front office job, just a small one, but he wants a front office job. So <laughs> Boy, I thought I that was pretty Herschel cool. Walker. Oh yeah, I, I've always liked him. Yeah. I think he stayed clean, too, it seems like. I stayed out of trouble. He did, and I think he's just done a lot. And He joked about his hometown. He's like, if you have one year to live, come live in my hometown because you're going to be able to accomplish everything you need to accomplish in my hometown because it's so small and mm -hmm. just, you know, very blue-collar. And, uh, you know, um, just it's just fun to, like, meet these guys and really kind of get to know them as people mm -hmm. and sort of their upbringing and how they – what drives them, you know, what drives them. And then, you know, somebody else – I guess in the SEC that I've always enjoyed, you get you kind of get used to the personalities. And one person I think we miss in the SEC, Steve Spurrier is one of them, but Les Miles. You probably guessed I was going to say that, I right? I figured that was coming, yeah. Les Miles is just, 
Um, we had an opportunity at AL.com last year. He was, before he took the, the, the Kansas job, to go to his house in Baton Rouge, and we spent some time with his, uh, his um, two daughters and his son. His other son was away at camp, and I guess uh, it was his wife were all there, and he's got this acting career that he's pursuing, right? And so he was coaching us up on his acting career and how he learns how to do all this stuff. But I'll tell you what, he is just, while he has that, that, that charisma and that kind of goofy personality, he's still very much just a, like, He's a like he's just got that embracing like dad mode, and you know at one point I actually shared my personal story with him, and he was like Lauren, I just want to give you a hug right now, and I was like, Whoa. you know, and it just it just meant a lot to me because I in that moment I just felt like this is somebody that um, you know here's my story, and you, you you flip off the camera and you flip off all the lights and all the other stuff and you just say I want to take this moment to applaud you for all your successes what you've done to overcome tragedy and to become the young lady that you are now and it was almost like a, a dad moment you know yeah, something that yeah. he might say to one of his daughters or whatever so that That's was something pretty special a lot of people would never see right nope because that was completely off camera and uh, you know his daughter um, Smacker she lives in, in in Texas right now but she's pursuing journalism and so I've been mentoring her a little bit here and there and um, you know I think she's well on her way and certainly um, has a bright future. Mm -hmm. What about who, who else do you want to interview? Who's on your list? Ooh. And in like in what capacity? Like do you want to do something cool with them? You know jumping off cliffs, skydiving? And yeah all. well okay so I have skydived before which was super fun. Um, I did that actually at Myrtle Beach so it was really cool because when we went up we were basically halfway over the ocean halfway over land and so we were kind of like, you know, circling around, which I thought was a blast. But in terms of who I would like to interview, um, you know, I think there's obviously a lot of star athletes that, that you know, kind of come into the mix. Um, ooh, see, I get put on the spot here where it's like I want to. You can think on it if you want. Um, you know, I think there's just a variety of, of people I guess that I look up to. I mean, obviously, I don't, you know, I don't want to get into politics, but if at any point in, in my life I would be able to interview any of the former presidents, current president, whoever it may be, I mean, that's, that's one of those things. Like, they're the commander in chief. They are the head of office mm -hmm. in this entire wonderful country of ours. And so having that opportunity to interview um, somebody in that power, in that position, would be really, really cool. I think so, yeah. I've always said um, if I was invited to the White House, I don't care who the president is. I haven't agreed with all of them, but by golly, I'd go. Oh my goodness! I would go, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I, I went to D.C. to visit. Uh, I guess it was two years ago around Christmas time, and everything was decorated. And of course, I was watch, looking at everything from afar. But it's just, um, it's enamoring. There's just some sort of aura that surrounds the White House and the monument, and you know, just the the political landscape. I know has has obviously gotten a lot of people. Um, you know, in, in a, a very uh, separate kind of landscape that people, you know, I, I guess I'm looking for the right word. It's, 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 it's definitely put a big divide in our country, and I hate to see it, and I just hope that with time and healing and everybody can mm -hmm. get back on the same page because I love this beautiful country of ours. I mean, I am so blessed and thankful for it and, um, you know, just hate that sometimes that, becomes a, div a divisive aspect of it. And it's even now infiltrating into sports. Yep. And, and I hate to see it. And I figure you're going to see, you know, a lot more of it, especially now you're going around the country. Mm -hmm. The whole new world's opening up to you professionally, it, it seems like. Yeah, absolutely. And that's just one of those things where, you know, I mind my P's and Q's and I just keep an open mind about everything. I think that, you know, I try not to go one way or another with my thoughts and beliefs and I stand firm on the beliefs that I have um, when it comes to, to my personal life, my faith, and my family, and those people that are in my mm -hmm. life on a day-to-day -day basis, and then everything else. You know, I'm an open ear. I just want to listen, learn, be educated, and hopefully, you know, do what I can to make a difference in the world. You love God. You love your family. You love sports. Yeah. Is that pretty much it right yeah. there? Yeah, that's, that's it, yeah. Um, I think I just, like, I have a love for life. Uh, I, I think that in the in this world you know there's so many things that come our way and circumstances get thrown at us and you know life is far from perfect but I think that if you can have this perspective and be positive about it and really use it as sort of your um, almost like your arsenal sort of your bulletproof vest of saying hey you know I'm gonna stand here and I mean 
you know, there's times where you're just like, oh my gosh, I can't take anymore. What other tragedies, what other, what other bad news can I take at this time? But you know, you just gotta keep fighting, you gotta stand up and keep moving forward. And you know, I think that if you can kind of have that outlook on life and know that you, know, you, you can control your own fate by taking those steps and making the right choices and getting to that point. You're gonna have curveballs. you're gonna get thrown off the tracks at times, but you know, overall surrounding yourself by the right people and really leaning into your faith, I think, mm -hmm. is really important. Well, I want to get to your your parents, and your, your whole situation there in just a minute, but have you had any athletes reach out to you since finding out what you've gone through and what you're going through, and whether theirs is the exact same or just another, maybe an injury, like really mm -hmm. just, just devastated them? Have you had some reach out to you and ask for? Yeah, you know, guys? I think there, there's been a lot of people that I have, talked to over over the years in terms of athletes and people that are going through something and one person that really is close to my heart is um, my good friend Timothy Alexander he went to UAB he was a football player there and um, you know this is where I believe you know everything happens for a reason and Timothy uh, at one point was selling tickets uh, he's, he's a par he's paralyzed from the waist down now and um, he was selling tickets or handing out tickets at the UAB baseball game. And he came up to me, I want to take a picture. You're on TV, you know. And I didn't really think much of it. And I was like, of course, you know, I'll take a picture. A year goes by, and I'm on the sidelines of UAB um, practice when fall camp had just opened up. And I hear somebody scream my name, hey, Lauren, Lauren. And I turn around, and there's Timothy sitting there on the sidelines in a UAB jersey. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, um, I'm on the football team now. And I'm like, what? You're on the football team? And so he said, yeah, I want to share my story with you. And so I committed to sharing his story when I was at CBS 42. And, you know, we just developed this great relationship. And it went far beyond this story and far beyond the football field. And I'll never forget after I had done the story and he was signing autographs at the, one of their fan day things, he texted me later that day and he said, Lauren, we're family now. I love you, sis. And I was like, oh. And I just sat there and, like, started crying because... In that moment, it helped me to remember why I do what I do as a sports reporter. It's not about the national championships. It's not about the confetti falling on the field. It's not about you know, all the, the big interviews that you get to do and, and who gets to interview this player or this coach. And, and I mean, that stuff's great and it's fun, but a lot of that stuff's kind of material, right? The stuff on the inside, it's, it's, it's the stories that you get to tell. And everyone has a story. All these coaches, all these players, these programs, everyone has a story. And when you really get to sit down and hear these stories and be a, a mouthpiece for these stories, I feel like I almost have a public service. I've been tasked with this opportunity to share these stories that could potentially have a positive impact on someone else. Someone else might be listening and say, you know what, Timothy did it. Timothy got into a car accident, he was paralyzed from the neck down, said, I will again walk one day, and he's now regained feeling, so he now only is paralyzed from the waist down. But I watched him get married a couple years ago, and he stood at his own wedding when he stood up there at the um, altar with his wife. And so it was just a beautiful moment, and you know, something I'll never forget, and it really reminds you that we do this job more, more than just for the fact that we get to go out there and be a part of some of the biggest games in, in history of, of sports. Yeah, very interesting. I haven't heard of him, but I'll look him up. He's a great, great guy. You'd love him. He's, uh, he spews inspiration, let me tell you. Good, I listen okay. to that guy, and I'm like, oh, that just, like, it just melts my heart. So he's awesome. Well, let's, let's talk about your family. And what are your, what are your memories, like early memories of growing up? in your household, what was it like? Yeah, so I grew up in Roanoke, Virginia, in what you would consider a middle-class family. And, you know, for the most part, we were very close-knit, um, always on the go, like most families are. My brother played three sports. It was basketball, baseball, football. And for me, it was gymnastics. And so my dad was a volunteer coach. You'd always see him on the sidelines there coaching my brother. And I'd either be at gymnastics practice or on the monkey bar swinging around while my brother was out there playing football or baseball. Um, and but how did you get into that? How did I get into gymnastics? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so when I was three, my parents were pretty much fed up with me jumping on the beds. And I've got the battle wounds to show for it where I pretty much busted my lip and had to go to the ER and get stitched up multiple times. And so finally, they said, we got to get this girl, you know. And at age three, like, that's still pretty young to be, you know, considering sports and going in that direction. And so, you know, for me, um, 
gymnastics just seemed to be a good fit. You know, I was, I was real petite and just energetic and bounced all over the walls. And so I, they enrolled me in gymnastics at the age of three. And within one week of playing in the noodles and the foam pit and, you know, doing the, the little things that kids do at the gym, they're like, hey, this girl's got some talent. We need to put her on the team. At and three. At three. And so then I became um, competitive by the time I was four and five years old. So essentially, um, it didn't take long for me and my family to realize, like, okay, maybe this is going to be the sport that I'm going to focus on and really devote my time to. And so um, it really was dedication because in the sport of gymnastics, it is a sport that is like a, like a, a full-time job almost. I know that we were training um, – when I got to middle school and high school, I was training four hours a day, uh, four to five days a week, and commuting over an hour each way to and from school every day to get to the gym to train. So, I mean, my schedule was crazy. God but, bless your parents. Oh, I know. <laughs> the day that I turned 16, they're like, here are the keys, you know? <laughs> yeah. So they were happy to finally be able to pass that off to me. So as soon as I got my learner's permit, they're like, all right, we're getting out on the interstate. We're practicing. So, um, you know, nevertheless... It just became a sport that I was dedicated to and really wanted to focus on getting a college scholarship. And so, um, you know, my parents were really supportive of me and my brother. And, you know, I, th I, would, I would say that, you know, they were always kind of there for us when we needed our spirits lifted and when we were having a bad day. If I had a bad day in practice, my mom was always there to kind of be the, the cheerleader that was like, it's okay, Lauren, you know, get back up there. You'll do it again tomorrow. It'll be okay. And, you know always took me to get ice cream when I'd have a good day. That was like my big treat, like, oh, I want to go get TCBY or whatever. And, um, you know, my dad obviously loved gymnastics as well. He wasn't quite as well versed in it as my mom, per se, but he obviously traveled with us to all the gymnastics meets and, you know, was also a big supporter and, um, you know, just having him there. And one story I tell people, and this is sort of kind of gives you a little glimpse into sort of the support system with my parents. So when I was a level 10, it was my first national champion uh, national meet that I was competing at that level and so I'm on the big stage what age is this I was 10 years old okay. and we traveled to Florida and so I'm uh, on the balance beam and as I told you before the balance beam is the tough one and I get up there and I'm going through my routine and I uh, am about to finish off uh, finish out the routine and do my dismount and I start to wobble and I fall and of course when I hit the mat you know I'm not hurt of course but when I hit the mat, I just felt this like disappointment flush over me because I'm thinking I'm on the national stage. My parents have spent all this money to travel me here to Florida for this meet, and now I'm going to let them down. And in that moment, as I kind of pick myself up off the mat and about to get back up on the balance beam, I hear from across the gym, my mom yells. She says, don't worry, Lauren, we're still going to Disney World. And in that moment, I was just like, wow. You know, as much as I was afraid I had disappointed them and I, I was disappointed that I couldn't finish and stick the routine, I knew that, that, you know, that love and support was always there for me no matter what. And so that was so meaningful to me and, you know, really just felt like that support system was important and kind of, you know, getting me to where I am today as well as my brother. You had to get up and finish, I guess, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. You have to get up and finish or else they'll uh, dock you several mm -hmm. points yeah. and you might just scratch and end up getting a zero. So you don't want to do that. So I'm, I, I would think too, something you learn from that is, I mean, you just, like, as long as you give your all, you prepare and give your all, that's mm -hmm. really what's most important. I, I don't know. Is that any less, is that similar to what you were taught as a child? Yeah, I think in any sport, um, you know, as long as you're putting forth the effort and dedicating yourself to that sport and, you know, putting in the extra time and really taking it seriously. And there were times that it was tough because I was, you know, broken bones, broken ankle, messed up my back at the age of 12 and, you know, still have back problems from that, you know, to this day. And, you know, kind of fighting through those injuries, fighting through those mind blocks. You know, gymnastics is a very mental sport. But I think the key is, you know, when you, when you kind of step foot in sort of that arena and say, okay, I'm going to compete for this. I'm going to earn this college scholarship. I knew in my mind that's what I really wanted. And so, you know, forget the Olympics, forget ever achieving that level. For me, college, you know, scholarship was what I really wanted to, to earn. And part of that, too, was because we had spent so much time and money getting to where I was, this would be an opportunity to kind of pay it all back. And so, you know, I would say when I was uh, well into middle school, that's when I really decided that's what I was going to do. 
And you did it. Yep, and I did it. Division one. I mean, that's any Division one athlete to me is is incredible. That's a huge feat that very few people do. Absolutely, yeah. I was very fortunate, and you know, again, I was coming off an injury-prone season my junior year, which is when you get heavily recruited. So it was definitely a struggle to get those looks from colleges that I was interested in. Um, you know, but then when Rutgers came along, I was like, oh, who's Rutgers? Like, I don't know nothing about Rutgers. And then started learning more about them and finding out that their academics and their, you know, the academic institution that Rutgers is is phenomenal and knew that I could go get a great education and be part of a team and, and actually have a chance to compete and, and be part of something. Well, you were probably there when the team was, the football team was doing pretty good, weren't you? Mm -hmm. uh, Greg Shiano, is that right? Was yep, there? Greg Shiano was there um, when I was at Rutgers. And so my first, my freshman year, we were 1-11. and 11. So talk about devastating. You go to school and you're thinking like, oh, cool, like, new chapter in my life. Like, I'm going to go to all the football games. And then it's like, womp, womp. Um, but I stuck with them. I was, I was Scarlet Knight through and through. And so we gradually progressed and began to improve. And then my senior year went to a bowl game. And so it was just really exciting to be part of that. And then, of course, the following year after I graduated is when they were kissing that BCS door of about to, uh, you mm -hmm. know, being part of that BCS era. And, um, you know, unfortunately, couldn't get the job done. But uh, I, was, I was there when they became the Cinderella that everybody was cheering for and was yeah, hopeful yeah. that they were going to do something. So, so what about, let's, let's go now to, let's, like, the day before you got the call from your dad, the call, I guess. What was your family life? In your life, life. Yeah. Well, so at this point, um, I'm at Rutgers. I'm a freshman in college. And so I left, uh, I went to Giles High School, so right outside of Blacksburg, Virginia. Um, you know, I'd left home and, and, you know, really had a good sense that everything was fine. I thought that, you know, my parents, um, you know, empty nest syndrome was tough. My brother was in the military, so he He's was. He's older than you. Yep, two and a half years older. So he was, he was over, uh, he was uh, stationed in Virginia Beach. And so he was about three or four hours from home. And he would travel home on the weekends all the time, so they would get to see him. And for me, I was at Rutgers, so I was about eight hours away. And my parents had just come to visit about a month prior and come to watch me compete. And it was pretty cool, something special, because I went out there and it was just an exhibition routine, which basically means I just got to go out there and sort of show the coaches and my parents what I was capable of. I was a freshman. I wasn't ready for the lineup yet. Um, but they were there, and they got to support me in that moment, and it was an exciting time. And, you know, I just remember that being the last time that I would see them would be that February when, um, you know, I kissed them the goodbye as they left to go home that Sunday and then got the phone call from my dad. Um, I had gone, uh, I was studying for some exams and uh, set my alarm clock that night and fell asleep. And I remember my phone ringing and I wake up and I look at the caller ID and it said home. and course my heart kind of dropped because I was like well it's the middle of the night um, might have been about 3 30 or so and I was like well this is weird um, and so I answer the phone and my dad's on the other side and he says Lauren he's like I need to talk to your brother and I said well what's wrong and he said I just need to talk to your brother and I said dad what's wrong and I could hear this distress and heart heartache in his voice and then he told me he said Lauren your mom died and at that time I'm thinking you know my mom was 45 seemingly in good health. Um, she had had degenerative disc disease where she was having to go see a pain management doctor and have multiple surgeries to kind of cope with that pain. But for the most part, nothing seemed out of place um, to me. But my parents also did a good job of waking up every morning and putting a smile on their face and making everything seem okay. Did you have any clue, first of all, that there was struggles um, you know, I think when you look back, there's hindsight's always 2020. I think that you do uh, see signs, but I don't think I was ever educated enough to understand what addiction was and how to understand it. You know, my dad growing up struggled with alcoholism. Um, he uh, was also in the military. Uh, he was in the Navy. I was born in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, um, Gitmo. And I know that he struggled with that, and alcohol was his resource and his outlet. And as a child, though, it was easy to compartmentalize because he would struggle, and then you know I would hear overhear him and my mom fighting, and then it'd be like, okay, you need to go back to your AA meetings, and then things would be fine. And so I just didn't quite comprehend it. And you know, same thing with my mom. I knew she was in pain, but I didn't understand the magnitude of it, and I didn't really quite see that it was enough pain that it could have been detrimental on her her life and her overall well-being. And so. 
when he had called me, he said, Lauren, I need you to get on the next plane you can, and I'll be at the airport to pick you up. And so I get on a plane and uh, land at the Roanoke Airport, and I remember just sprinting through the terminal, because in that time, I just all I wanted to do was just like run and jump in his arms. Mm -hmm. And I was wanted him to tell flight? me. Or did you have to connect and just drag um, it out even more? So I had actually, a friend a friend took me to Philadelphia, and so it was a direct flight, flight from Philadelphia. Okay. Um, so he was able to drive me to the airport there. But as you can imagine, I mean, it was an hour drive to Philadelphia, and then you got to get on the plane. Oh, yeah. And um, I mean, I was frantic, because all I wanted to know in that moment is like, okay, what happened to mom? And I just wanted to know my dad was going to be there, because I felt like only his hug and his embrace would make everything okay. And as I'm sprinting through the terminal, I run outside and I look everywhere and he's nowhere to be found. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, he's probably taking care of things. It's gonna be okay. And next thing you know, my uncle and my cousin pull up to the curb and they get out and they're hugging me and they're really not saying anything at this point. And so, again, I'm just thinking my dad's at the hospital, he's taking care of things, it's gonna be okay. And as we start to drive the car, you know, um, I finally worked up the courage and I said, Uncle Mike, I said, where's my dad? And he had to pull the car over and said, Lauren, I'm sorry, but your dad passed away too. So in a matter of, um, you know, I got the phone call about 3.30 that morning, uh, roughly about 3.30, and um, I think he passed away around like 6 or 7. So I think the time between their deaths was, um, I want to say probably 5 or 6 hours. At home? At home. Did you have any, did your dad say any reason why your mom died? Did you, did you remember asking? Nope. I asked him um, what happened, and he said, I can't explain it now. Just get on the next flight you can. So I really had no indication or clue as to what had happened. And again, she's 45 years old. You know, my brain wasn't thinking something sudden like a heart attack or anything like that. And so um, I really couldn't process it. And so then when my uncle told me my dad passed, again, I couldn't process it because I'm like, wait, what? I don't understand. And honestly, it would be months before we would actually learn what took their lives um, through the toxicology reports. And so both of those reports indicated that both of them overdosed from the prescription drug fentanyl. And so they had actually gotten to a point where they were abusing the fentanyl and taking it orally because obviously you're able to get that fix a lot quicker than if you put the time release patch on. And so both of them had been taking it, um, abusing it to some degree and um, you know, I guess the big question that enters your mind is, was it intentional, was it accidental? And both the reports um, indicate accidental. And, you know, I think there's a lot that goes into investigating how that comes mm -hmm. about. Um, you know, my mom had painted her nails that night. They had packed a cooler. They had a, they had a plan the next day. So they don't think anything was premeditated. But, you know, I also believe in that moment, in, in that moment of weakness, and I think this is where, as I've learned more and kind of educated myself on mental health and, you know, mental health illnesses and addiction, you know, people go into those modes of weakness. And it just takes, you know, a split second to go into that minute of, weak, you know, that moment of weakness to, to do something, um, you know, that could alter your life. And I truly believe that neither one of my parents left this earth intentionally. I believe that they, um, you know, wanted to be here for my brother and I wholeheartedly. And despite all the pain that they were in for, you know, several years leading up to this, this incident, this tragedy, that they were, you know, such a big part of our lives. I know that they didn't intentionally take their own lives, mm -hmm. but I also cannot speak to what they were feeling internally yeah. in those hours leading up to their deaths. I don't know what their brain and their body was telling them mm -hmm. as they were struggling and I truly think that they were drowning, you know, that they were suffocating from this, this disease of addiction. And they hadn't worked up the courage to allow others to know that they were struggling with this. They had done everything they could to keep brushing yeah. it under the rug to try to avoid the inevitable, which was, hey, we need to go get help. This is a problem. Maybe they thought they were protecting you and your brother. Who, how did your brother find out? For, from me. Um, which was really difficult because my dad ended up not being able to get in touch with my brother. And, and so by the way, I why did him. he call you to say, or he said, hey, I need to talk to your brother. Well, your brother didn't live anywhere close to you, right? Right. So he was trying, he was trying to get in touch with him first because I think he wanted to talk to my brother before he spoke with me about mom dying. And he couldn't get in touch with them. So I, I think uh, at this time they had a landline, my parents. You know, they were out in the country. So uh, mobile service did not exist at the time out where they were at. 
And so I think he had been frantic trying to get my brother's number and couldn't get it to go through. So that's why he called me and said, I need your brother's number. And obviously he was unable to get through to him. So um, he said, I need you to tell your brother. And I think that was probably the hardest thing I've ever had to do because I had to call my brother and Did you call him while you were at home before you left for the airport? Yeah, I had called him when I was was uh, still at Rutgers in my dorm room. So that's the first thing I did before I started packing my bags was call my brother and, and let him know. And, um, you know, it's kind of crazy. We actually uh, more recently um, sat down and, and did another video shoot, and it's really the first time I'd heard my brother talk about his side of the story. You know, because I've shared my story time and time and time again, but, you know, I never really knew what in that moment what he was doing. He had been working that night. He was, um, uh, I guess he said he was officer of the deck and he had been on watch until about 1 a.m. Um, it might have been a little bit sooner than that and then he went home and then went to bed. And you know, just hearing his account of that story, um, it was tough just reliving it and knowing um, you know, we both went through a very similar situation but have two different perspectives on it and kind of how things went down. Who did you want to call first oh, well first of all when you hear your when your dad calls tells about your mom imagine you want to tell somebody was it your brother was there maybe it was like okay, well I can't tell I can't this is something traumatic I can't tell my mom but dad just told me something awful like what what were your first your instincts of, of who to go to and what well I mean at that point so my roommate I was living with uh, you know I was in a dorm room so my roommate was there and obviously she was was um, there to help me kind of through those moments of getting my flight booked and trying to take care of everything I needed to in that time. Um, but you know, one person I'll point to, and, and this is a relationship that really um, strengthened and, and continues to strengthen since all of this happened, is my aunt uh, Linda, my mom's sister, and my uncle Mike. So really, you know, I was 18 years old when my parents passed away, but. I was still a baby. I didn't even know how to write yeah. a check. You know, my parents were always very supportive and said, focus on schoolwork, focus on gymnastics, we'll take care of the rest. And so I didn't have some of those tangible things that I needed to be an adult. And I would say that my aunt and uncle really kind of took me under their wing and sort of um, got me to a point where I could sort of spread my wings and fly. Because honestly, you know, I, I was this, you know, child at the time. And, you know, my, when my aunt, Re recounts what happened you know she said she just saw this little girl that was just so lost and I didn't know what I was going to do with the rest of my life how I was going to get there and so I think it was very important that they were part of my life and really just kind of took me in like their own and uh, you know kind of helped guide me in that direction and sort of helped me to reevaluate who I was and to kind of get past this this point in my life that was so traumatic and a lot of it had to do too with the, uh, the understanding of how my parents died. Because for so long I was so, you know, uh, I guess so uh, blind to how they actually died. Because I didn't want to believe that they died of overdoses. I didn't want to believe that they were addicts. Because to me that's a stigma. People, you know, frown upon that. Nobody wants to talk about it. And so for so many years I would share this sugar-coated story of how they died, thinking that maybe people would think more of them and wouldn't think less so of them. So what would you say? I would say my mom died of respiratory failure, which is true, but I wouldn't say she died of respiratory failure because of an overdose. So I would say my mom died of respiratory failure and my dad died of a heart attack, which not true, my dad died of respiratory failure, but a heart attack sounds more reasonable because you're thinking, oh, well, he died because my mom died. So, you know, I'm just generating yeah. the, uh -huh. these things in my head. And, you know, my dad was distraught. My dad, um, I know from the accounts at him going to the hospital to take care of things, they were very concerned for his well-being, that he was very shook up, he was very unstable. And so I just kind of fabricated this thing in my head because I felt like it sounded better. Yeah. I felt like people might judge me and judge them differently because of it. So what did you do? You needed, you needed parents. You were young. How did this affect you? Like, did you... Did you kind of go off the deep end, you know, and, and do some things that you, it's like, why would I even do that? I mean, how did, how did you respond? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I think the, the hardest part for me was two weeks after burying both of my parents, I went back to school. My aunt and uncle said, Lauren, you've got a commitment to yourself, your university, to your teammates, you've got to go back to school. And I think that was the best thing I could have done. 
But I mean, in terms of going off the deep end, one thing I will say is, uh, you know, I'm very fortunate. I never have never picked up uh, any substance. I've never drank alcohol. I have no desire. And it's just something that when I was 15 years old, I made that decision. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to do drugs. And were I'm you thankful tempted for it. When, it. when this happened, were you ever tempted? You know what's to? crazy? I never was tempted because I think in that moment, I was very much under the notion of I'm going to do this on my own. And as a believer in Christ and somebody that always leaned into my faith, it was, all, it was a time where I found myself almost turning my back a little bit to my faith because I was like, I'm going to do this on my own. And I was adamant that I was going to get through it, but it was almost like me being hard-headed and not realizing like, hey, there are people surrounding me that are here to help me. Let them help. And so after you know several months went by, and really I would say about a year, year and a half, is when I started to kind of let the walls come down, and I started saying, okay, you know, if I continue on this path, I was depressed, I, you know, I, I was failing, flunking my classes, had never seen an F on a paper in my life, and suddenly I'm like, what is this? Did you realize this on your own, or did somebody tell you, Lauren, wake up? You realize that you're. Um, I think it was a combination of both. I think that I started to see that I was going down this path, but nobody really kind of like shook the finger at me and said, hey, you need to do this. But what I will say, and I think it was a blessing, is that when I was at Rutgers, you know, there were people there to support me. And, you know, there was kind of that period of time where everybody was like treading lightly with how to approach things with my grades and gymnastics and everything else. But it got to a point where my coaches and, and um, you know, my coaches especially, because they were really my parental figures while I was at Rutgers, they weren't giving me a hall pass. Nobody was saying, you know what, you know, your parents died, so we're going to let you just slide past this and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll just exempt you from this exam or this bad grade mm -hmm. or put in a, a petition to, to pass this class. They said, no, we're going to get a tutor and, you know, nothing below a 3.0 is unacceptable because, you know, we had a team average to maintain. And so they pushed me to be a better person and overall to be a better athlete, a better student. And I think had they have taken a different approach, this could have gone a completely different way. And so I really applaud them for taking the onus on themselves to say, you know what, no hall pass here. We're going we're gonna to help her through this. We're going to encourage her. But we're also going to be tough when we need to give tough love and show her that, that she can do this. She's just got to put her mind to it. Oh, yeah. Man, I, I'm guessing you've talked to them since and maybe been able to thank them to help you overcome Oh, yeah, that. absolutely. Um, you know, I, I'm still very much in touch with a lot of my teammates from Rutgers, and we have a real close-knit group that we travel a lot together, and we'll go on girls' trips together. And then I talk to my um, college coach quite a bit. And, you know, it's nice having social media nowadays because anything, you, anytime you post a an event update or, you know, an engagement or whatever else it is. It's like, oh, okay, cool. Um, you know, so you kind of have that open communication when uh, life things happen and, you know, just an open line of communication with people that you may not be able to pick the phone up and call every single day. Did you ever talk to anybody, though? Did you get a, you know, a psychiatrist, psychologist, therapist, whatever to to talk to? Um, yeah, that was kind of mandated at the beginning. They said, yep, you're going to go see somebody coaches? at Rutgers. Okay. Yeah. And so they put me with somebody. And of course, I was resistant. I was like, nah, I'm not doing that. Yeah, crazy people do that. Yeah, I'm not doing that. Uh -uh. But then I realized, wait, I like, I need this. And so then even when I graduated from Rutgers um, and moved and was starting my first job, I made, you know, found somebody to go see that was very helpful in kind of letting me just unleash all those yeah. emotions. And so I think just it was kind of the trickle effect, you know, in the healing process. Um, you know, but I think one thing I have to say that I think has really benefited me the most in this healing process is transparency and being truthful with myself and with others. Did you feel like a literal weight lifted when you were honest and said what really happened? Mm-hmm. It was, and it's weird because it was almost like a physical weight. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're bound to this thing. I felt like I was shackled to this shame for so many years, protecting this legacy of my parents. And then when I actually shared the truth of their story, people responded in such a way that was so positive and said, you know what, like, we loved your parents. I mean, even my dad's coworkers for 10 years didn't know what happened until I did this public story where they were like, oh, you know, I can't believe your parents were going through that. You know, and people would say, you know, we had, you know, kind of had an idea that something might be going on, but we weren't sure. I wish we would have known more. Maybe we could have jumped in and helped. And so it was almost like everybody, 
embraced the situation more and said, you know what, I'm going to learn from this and hopefully I can help out my family member. Or, you know, people would come to me and say, you know, I've got a brother that's struggling or a dad or a mom or whoever it may be. And suddenly now I've got more people being transparent with me and having these open-ended conversations of, okay, now what do I do? Mm -hmm. well, what has it done to, what did it do to you and your brother Alan's relationship? It strengthened us a lot. Um, you know, he and I were always close growing up, but I found that we were close in moments that my parents hated it the most. When it's 10 o'clock at night and we're supposed to be going to bed, he and I are getting along, right? And they're yeah. like, you guys need to go to bed. You know how that is when you have siblings, and it's like, uh, you know, just those nitpicky things one minute, and then the next we'd all be out running around, riding our bikes around the neighborhood, and then he'd be tormenting me, and, um, you know, he, he, he was always a big hunter growing up. Him and my dad loved doing that together, and so he'd have the, the deer in the back of the truck, and he'd be, you know showing me what I didn't want to see. Um, you know, so that always kind of became the, the ongoing joke with him. But, uh, you know, it really strengthened us. And, and that even took time. You know, I think that we took two different perspectives on it. Um, for him, as somebody in the military, he kind of strapped on the boots. He deployed and did his thing. And that's how he took care of his maybe anger and, um, you know, grief. And then I did my thing at Rutgers. So I think in a, in a way we kind of handled it differently but over time have kind of met back in the middle. And so, you know, it's great to have him in Birmingham here and we're, you know, you know, uh, close together now because obviously he was still in the military for several years after my parents had passed. So we didn't see each other much at all because he was in Virginia Beach. But So why did he come here? Was it just to be with you, to be close I mean, to you? Yeah. That's great. I mean, yeah. Because y'all are what's left. You're who, yep. the immediate family. Yeah. And so, um, you know, just having that and having that sort of person there um, and then of course my fiance lives here and then my family is still in Virginia so we do tr you know I try to go back home for Christmas and holidays and stuff and there's you know my aunt and uncle and my cousins are all big support system and so you know I think everybody has handled this in different ways and um, the tragedy that it is uh, has been a struggle but you know I think that I feel blessed that my platform as a reporter and kind of where I am in that regard has helped me to, to be a voice for people that might be shackled to that shame. And so I feel that while sports is my passion, that, that being able to share my story and encourage people to share their stories is really my purpose. Mm -hmm. did, did your, what did you know about your dad's PTSD before? You know, I knew a little bit about it, not a lot. I knew that he was struggling with it, and I knew that was a big reason for his relapses when he would drink. Would and he talk about this much at all, either alcohol? Did y'all talk about that in your family? It, nope. It was, a very, it was a very limited amount of discussion about it. Um, we knew it existed as Did they kids. ever say... I don't want you drinking, look, this is something I do, I don't want you doing it, anything like that? No, I mean, more so with the drugs, obviously, when it came to, you get to a certain age in high school and you start to see the marijuana and the other drugs being passed around, I mean, they were very, like, anti-drugs, but with me, I, I made that decision at 15 not to drink, so they never had to tell me not to, because I didn't care to, and I, I made it very clear yeah, to them. A lot of people make that decision, I think, but when you get the pressure at that age, mm -hmm. I mean, most people... They, they're, they're gonna they give into it, I guess, if they make yeah. the decision. Not. For sure. I mean, they were very open with us about that and making the right decisions. Yes, there was disciplinary action, and obviously, they always tried to make that very clear. Um, you know, but in terms of the PTSD, I think the biggest struggle was, you know, uh, when we'd flip on the TV and there'd be Saving Private Ryan or one mm -hmm. of those type of movies. That's where I would really see my dad's, um, you know, uh, emotions change a lot, and so. Uh, it, it was talked about some, but my brother and my dad were very close, and they would talk about a lot of those things, because my brother from Itty Bitty wanted to go into the Navy. He wanted to follow in my dad's footsteps, and my dad only served five years, um, and my brother served 12, and so, you know, I think he always had that dream of doing that, and so for my dad and brother, they had that special bond, and I think to some degree, my dad tried to protect me and my mom from some of those things. Um, as far as the military was concerned, just to kind of make that separation. So I think he felt he could talk to my brother pretty openly about it, more so than me or my mom. So your, your dad must have been, he wasn't Desert Storm, he must have been before then, is that right? Um, he, because he went in late, I want to say he was... Or was he the in the early 90s, and late 80s? It would be late 80s, because was, was, he was in Gitmo, I was born in 84. Okay. So I want to say that was, and my brother was born in Memphis in 82. 
So I think when I was born, we were there for a year, and then he got out shortly after. Okay. I wonder if he was involved in Oh, he got out, so he got out in the late 80s? Yeah. Okay. All right. I was born in 84, so I think I want to say maybe 85 or 86. Okay. I'd have to go back and look. That's a good question. Okay. I'm just, you know, here you are, the, a child of, a, of someone who served our country. Of course, you got in your family, your brother served. and A lot of cousins what, that served in the Marines as well. I've yeah, got so three you, cousins that have served in the Marines. And my aunt, I've got to give a shout out to my aunt Linda, first female woman in the Virginia National Guard. She was the first female. Um, I don't know the date on that, but. That wow. was pretty big for her. So That's awesome. I did look at your Facebook page recently, and I saw, I guess it was a random picture, and there's a big American flag there, you know. So, yeah. Um, I know where your heart is, you know, when it comes to patriotism. and But, I mean, yeah, your dad struggled with this. Um, he had his own demons. And part of that, I guess, was a result of serving our country in some way or another. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, I don't know. What, what's, like, how have you... How have you overcome this? I'm, I'm, I'm really just interested in how, you know, you, you, know, you went through some depression, but now you've opened up, you've been transparent, and what's happened since? I mean, I think that, like I said, has been a big key to me feeling this sense of freedom. I think that that's one thing um, you hear a lot when you uh, talk with different groups, Al-Anon groups and groups where, uh, you know, alcoholism or substance abuse is at the core of it, is setting yourself free. And, um, you know, I think that's the one thing that has been beneficial because I think that when we compartmentalize these things a lot and we are so ashamed of, of who we are, it's hard to kind of, you, you kind of enclose yourself in the shell and you feel like you're alone and you feel like you've got nobody to turn to. But if you can, you know, kind of break out of that shell, and it takes time. I mean, it took me talking to one person that took, turned into two, that turned into ten, and sharing this story. Um, you know, but I think that just having that resiliency and that sort of, you know, I'm not going to let this get me down. I'm going to grab the bull by the horns. I'm going to, you know, walk each day the best that I can. And it's not easy. I mean, it's not easy. You're going to have bad days. You're going to walk through this life. And, and, and people look at you like you're crazy, like, well, I went through this. How do you expect me to overcome this thing that I went through and have a different outlook on life? And, you know, um, from a physiological standpoint, I don't know what it is. I'd love to get inside somebody's brain and know how one person can overcome a sports injury and this person can't, or one person can, you know, overcome a mental illness and this person can't. But we're all fighting, you know. I think we're all fighting. And I think that's the truth of it all, even with addiction. You're never cured of addiction, right? You're always fighting that battle. And I would say the same with depression, mental health, all those things. And so I think that really it's just putting, you know, surrounding yourself by positivity and around the right people and obviously your faith. And I think those are probably the big key components that allowed me to get to where I am today. Was your, did you ever doubt, uh, you may have said this, so forgive me, I know you, you kind of mentioned it, but did you doubt your faith ever? And has it, is it stronger now than it was before your parents' death? Um, yes, I would say that when I, as I alluded to a little bit before, was that when I was in college, had gone back to Rutgers, and I was starting to really, you know, I'd kind of turn my back on my faith. And not completely, but it was one of those things where I wasn't, I wasn't leaning on my faith to get me through this time. I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm, I've got this on my own. And then I realized over time, like, what am I doing? Because I was always the one, even when my parents were struggling, um, even when I would see a glimmer of pain or whatever suffering, you know, throughout that time when I was in high school at home, I would always, you know, hey, mom and dad, you know, let's go to church today. And, um, you know, I would always kind of send little inspirational cards. And that was always a big thing for me. But that's something both my parents and I shared. And so I think that growing up, I had this strong faith and then, you know, a little bit of the storm kind of happened. And then I feel like every single day, even when I thought my faith was at its strongest, it continues to blossom and grow. I don't think you ever stop growing in your faith. Shouldn't, yeah. What do you want people to know about your parents? Um, I wanted them to know that they were very loving people and people that, uh, you know, they were obviously charismatic. My dad was like the jokester and always just, you know, um, kind of doing things in left field, and you'd just be like, okay, uh, kind of the goofball. And my mom was always sort of the rock in the family, you know, trying to keep all the seams together. When my dad wanted to go spend money on something, my mom was like, no, nah, we probably need to rethink this here. But overall, um, 
I think that they were just very influential people. And, you know, I'll never forget my mom had said prior to her passing that she felt she didn't have any friends. She felt she was alone. And I think that was a lot of the depression and the addiction consuming her. But Did you recognize that at the time? You probably didn't make the connection, though, did no, you? No, and I, I'd been at school, so I wasn't sort of seeing some yeah, of that yeah. depression that she was experiencing. And my aunt, Linda, was the one that had really recognized a lot of that. Um, but uh, when we walked into that funeral home that night, after their passing and had a double funeral for them. The amount of people that were in that funeral home was so unbelievable and I think just the support and it was like in that moment all I could think to myself was like see mom like you did have friends and these are all your friends and the people that love you and support you and you know I know I know that they were winking from heaven yeah, and as, yeah. as much as she probably she saw that yeah <laughs> Um, you know, so that, 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 you know, that's kind of a bittersweet time, but just, just the love that they shared. And I think that's what I love is when I meet up with my former teammates and their parents and people that were surrounded by my parents all the time. We share these stories. And, oh, you remember when your mom did this, your dad did this, and, um, you know, when they helped Mackenzie out with this or whoever it may be. And I just, uh, you know, really my heart, I guess, you know, kind of flutters a little bit when I hear that because it's, it's like I know. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, you know, I think too, so many people have entered my life since then. I think that I have a lot of people that I consider my other parents, my Birmingham parents, because I think that um, I've just surrounded myself by people and, and been blessed with different people in my life that have sort of taken me in like their own. And um, it's special because it's like a relationship that maybe if my parents were here, maybe I wouldn't have that relationship, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a strong unique relationship that's different than just saying, oh, we're friends. It's, it's a lot more, um, you know, it's a lot stronger and a lot more spiritual than that. And uh, I'm blessed for it because I think that the people that are in my life today really have helped to mold me into who I am. You know, I think my parents kind of had the reins at the beginning and then, you know, they sort of handed off the torch. Sure. Well, the stopwatch is going and I, I, I wanted to I've enjoyed it, and, but I have a few more questions. You got to okay. Get, let's do it. Um, I'm, I'm I mean, what's what's next for you? Like a book? I know you're you're speaking to a lot of groups and a lot of podcasts and interviews. So, what do you want to do? Yeah, I I think that the biggest thing for me, as I said, you know, sports is definitely my passion, but my purpose is having the opportunity to go speak to people. And so, you know, the opportunity to come here and speak on your podcast and to go out and do different speaking events, and that's you know, in a multitude of arenas. Is it, uh, middle school, high school, um, colleges, talking about good decision making, addiction, faith, um, you know, testimony, you know, speaking out, sharing your story, transparency, all those topics kind of bundled into one. And my hope is that, you know, in spreading that message and sharing that with people, they can take something positive from it. So yeah, my, my hope is to get out there and, and speak to as many people and be heard by as many people as possible. And it's kind of why I've taken that leap of faith and, um, you know, uh, built a website and kind of gotten myself to a place where, um, you know, I can try to do these things in my sometimes spare time when it's there, um, but trying to open up my schedule to be able to do more of that. So um, what else? What else do you want to cover maybe about your experience, your parents, your family, your job? Um, I feel like we touched all the bases here. Uh, it's been a great conversation. Um, you know, I just would say I would encourage people that if you know somebody that's struggling with addiction and is looking for help, you know, there are resources out there. Um, I volunteer with the Addiction Prevention Coalition, and we have a, um, a full directory. Um, it's apcbham.org of resources for people. And it's not one size fits all. Not every resource is going to help somebody. And sometimes it doesn't happen, you know, it takes multiple yeah. times to get people to that place where they're able to heal. But... Um, I want to encourage people that there is hope in recovery and that I truly believe that everybody in this world deserves uh, you know, a second chance at life. No matter what it is they're going through, everybody deserves a good quality of life. And so even if you are going down the darkest of roads and find yourself just you know, eaten up with this addiction or depression or whatever it may be, that there is help and that if you, you owe it to yourself to get yourself the help that you need to be able to try to seek out that good quality of life. And then also the prevention element. I think that we um, in this generation really have to focus on our younger generation to help them make these choices because we're in such a me society, social media, it's all about me, selfie, 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 me, 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 right? Mm -hmm. 
And so we got to get to these kids at a younger age and help them to realize that um, Chris Heron said it best. He was a former Celtics player. He's working on a campaign, and he said, you know, with addiction, a lot of times we focus on our worst day, but we forget about the first day. So what can we do as people educated in this arena to help our younger generation not to have that first day, to never pick up that, that beer, yes. to never pick up yeah. that joint or whatever it may be. And I think that the, you know, the sooner that we can do that and join hands in this force, um, hopefully the sooner we'll see these numbers start to decline in terms of uh, overdose, overdose and addiction. What's the most comforting thing somebody has said to you since your parents' death? Mm. It's been a lot of comforting things. Or maybe done, things. you know, said or yeah. done. Um, that's a good question. You know, there's been a lot of comforting things, but I think the one thing that still resonates with me and I think that it really allowed me to break the shackles off were, was when my aunt told me, she said, Lauren, you can't influence the opinions of others. You can't allow, you can't dictate how people are going to think of your parents if they find out the truth of how they died. Your parents, though, are not defined by how they died, but how they lived. And that, to me, is something that has resonated with me mm -hmm. because I still feel that through what I'm doing here today and from this day forward and what I've done in the past is really a reflection and almost kind of carrying the torch and sort of having that light, their legacy within me to continue to carry that on. And while I used to be afraid to step out and share their story, that they would be mad or ashamed, I actually feel like they're standing here in this room with us right now as, as we, we talk about them. Yeah. What about the harshest thing someone has said to you? Maybe that they just did not make you feel better at all. Mm. Anything stand out? No. I mean, for the most part, um, you know, I think the harsh part is recognizing the truth. I think just the this is, this is how it really was and piecing together some of the things where you build this picture as a child of like, oh, there's this perfect family. But in reality, in, in what I thought was perfect inside of that, you know, that mesh work were the flaws because every family has them. Every mm -hmm. family is dysfunctional, right? And so I think that, um, you know, that was probably the hardest thing was kind of to knock me back down to reality and say, hey, you know, things weren't as perfect as you thought they were. But it's also helped me to realize and maybe see what led to this progression and got them to where they were. And I'm still learning. You know, there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of things I have to lean into. But, um, you know, I think that was probably the most difficult part. But uh, over time, I realized it was all for the best. Man, we overshot our time by, woo! Yeah, sorry about that. About 25 uh, minutes. Hey, I've, I told you I'm a talker. I've, I've, this is a unique, one of my more unique interviews um, just because of your experience, but it's been awesome. It's yes. Been very beneficial to many people, I think, and so uh, appreciate your time. LaurenSisler.com. Yep, LaurenSisler.com, and then, of course, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all at Lauren Sisler. So okay. that's S-I-S-L-E-R. You know, my fantasy football name is Twisted Sisler. Is it? That's pretty yes. good. Okay. It's a good one, right? Don't That's steal good. that. Okay. Anything else? That's all. Thank okay. you so much for having me. I appreciate it. It's, it's an honor. It's been awesome. Appreciate it. Yep. Okay.